Greetings my fellow Electric Monkey Brains. Today we're going to take a first look at transformer design for switch mode power supplies. Now the design of the transformer is usually quite specific to the converter type. So in this video I'm only going to discuss concepts which are common to all the uh, converter types. Now switch mode power supplies are quite ubiquitous in the modern home. For example this mobile phone charger which plugs straight into the wall or this laptop charger here. They'll all contain transformer elements which will be similar to this. This is an E core because one half is shaped like an E. And 90% of the time these transformer cores will be made out of ferrite material. Ferrite is a material which has a high permeability. The permeability is a measure of the material to be able to store and guide the magnetic field which we're going to create by putting current in our windings here. Uh, many of the transformer cores you'll come across actually have a gap in the center PC. You can see that this has a gap in the center. Uh, usually the gap is there to be, allow the uh, core to be able to store more energy before it enters magnetic saturation. Saturation is where the core has a flux and it can't hold any more flux inside even though we are increasing the current in our windings. So in other words, uh, the extra current that we put in at that point will simply be wasted and the engineers will design to operate outside of that situation, obviously. So putting the gap in the transformer core al allows us to slightly avoid magnetic saturation, but it comes at the expense between uh, coupling between the primary and secondary windings. Now this depends on the converter type because some converter types like the flyback converter are actually designed so that the uh, transformer stores energy in between switching cycles and that means that most of the flyback converters will actually contain a core which has a little gap in it like this. But converters like the forward converter are designed not to store energy but to transfer it immediately from primary to secondary winding. So usually, but not always, those cores will contain no gap like that. So to choose a preliminary uh, core, what you would do is, uh, for example, go to the manufacturer's websites, TDK or Ferrox Cube, for example, or maybe even DigiKey. And there you could find uh, general guides which can help you to start. Uh, here, for example, you can search for cores by high power or low loss, etc. But keep in mind that this choice is only preliminary and there's a good chance you may have to change it later anyway. But for switch mode power supplies, usually one would design based on the amount of power which you need. Now, the more power you need, the more current you'll have in your transformer. And the more current there is, the more magnetic flux there will be inside the core. And as I mentioned earlier, too much flux in the core can cause saturation. So to avoid this, we should choose a core based on the maximum magnetic flux that it can handle when the transformer is operating in the maximum power condition. The magnetic field saturation value for a given core is often quoted as B sat, where B is the magnetic field, B saturation. It's sometimes it's given in the data sheet, sometimes not. However, actually it's roughly the same for all ferrite cores. It's somewhere between 0.2 to 0.4 Tesla. Now this is slightly confusing because one would think that a larger core can handle more flux. So how can it be the same for all cores, this saturation value? It's because B uh, is a magnetic field, not a flux. The flux is a magnetic field over an area, which would of course change if we were to increase the core size. Anyway, it doesn't matter because all you need is B sat, which is 0.2 to 0.4 for ferrites. And 90% of the time you're gonna be using a ferrite because that's the best material. So once you've chosen a core, you can find the data sheet and then look for the values of A, E and A, L. Uh, they're quantities which are commonly, very commonly given in the ferrite core data sheets. A, L is uh, just an inductance per turn and A, E is like an effective area, but it doesn't really matter. So then we would have A, L and we have A, E and of course we know B sat and then we can put them into this equation here where I sat is a saturation current and N is the number of turns. And that means that for our primary winding, uh, by choosing the number of turns, N, this equation will tell us the maximum current, ISAT, that our primary winding can handle before our chosen core will enter saturation. Now, don't forget that this is the peak current here. It's not an average current. 
So once you find your saturation current, you should compare it to the current which you actually need based on your power requirements. So for example, what I would do to find this is to write down the output power which my converter is designed for, and then I would put that equal to the input power multiplied by 0 0.8. Uh, 0 0.8 comes from the fact that I'm going to assume that my converter is going to be about 80% efficient. And then instead of writing the input power, I would write it in terms of the input voltage multiplied by the input current. And there's a good chance that you will already know your input voltage and it's usually quite stable. And here, this current in the input current, this is a average value and we need to convert that into um, the peak current. We need to find the peak current in our uh, core, transformer core. In order to convert the uh, input current, which is average, into the peak current, we need to know our duty cycle. And uh, this is where the analysis diverges slightly for different types of converter types. So I'm not going to uh, carry on here, I'm just going to stop. But basically, um, it depends on the converter type. At this point, I would refer you to um, some of the PDFs, which I'm going to link below, which discuss uh, specific converter types. And you can just try to follow one of these. Now, if you're a beginner, I would say just choose a ferrite as your material and then go with an E-core for your shape because that will work fine in 90% of the cases. If you're looking for more advanced materials and exotic shapes, then you should already know what you're doing and you won't be listening to me anyway. Now, it could also be the case that you already have a core, perhaps recycled from an old device, for example, but you don't have the data sheet for it. Now, in this case, you'd need to measure the saturation current yourself. Now, to do this, basically, you would wind a primary winding on your core, connect it to a MOSFET and put some current through it and then measure that current. Now, basically, the current rise, which you would measure, should be a straight line. When it begins to curve or deviate away from a straight line, then that's an indication you're entering into a saturation region. So you would choose a current as your maximum current, which is just before the core enters that saturation region. Then you would design your converter to work at or below that maximum current. Basically, I'll leave a link in the description below, which is a, a, a video showing this. Okay, so how do we actually come to wind our transformer? Well, here I've drawn half of a, a bobbin with some primary windings in black and then some secondary windings here. Now, in general, you want to put the primary winding as close to the core as possible because that's where all the energy enters the transformer and you want that energy to enter the core in the form of a magnetic field. And then on top of that, you would put secondary windings and usually they're all separated by layers of uh, tape and they use a special tape called, I think it's called Capcom tape. It's a yellow tape like this one and it uh, has a high uh, heat resistance and it offers good insulation between all the layers. Now, in general, when you wind your primary winding, you're going to, you want to use the entire length of the core. That's so that the magnetic field is evenly distributed along the length. If you don't have enough turns in the primary to use up all the length, then just make sure that the turns are evenly distributed along the length. Now, something else that you can do is to use multiple strands on the primary and connect them in parallel here like I've done and then just allow them to sit flat on the bobbin so that you can use up more of the length there. When you come to put your secondary windings on, usually the uh, transformer will contain more than one secondary uh, winding. If that's the case, the winding, uh, secondary winding which contains the most power should be closest to the core. Now here you can see I've drawn the magnetic fields in red, and this magnetic field line sort of goes all the way out, outside and encompasses all the windings which are inside it. Now there is an inductance associated with this magnetic field line and we call that mutual inductance because it's sort of mutually shared with all the windings. But sometimes the magnetic field can leak out as I've drawn here and that's not shared with all the uh, windings. That also has an inductance associated with it and we call that leakage inductance. Now leakage inductance can cause problems because when you turn the switches on and off this leakage inductance can cause high voltage spikes which can damage MOSFETs. Now, engineers usually put snubber circuits on, which is just a diode, resistor, and capacitor to get rid of this leakage inductance energy. But that depends on the converter type. It's different, usually. 
Uh, something else that they do to get rid of the leakage inductance is actually to put a separate winding on the transformer itself. That's called a demagnetization winding or a reset winding. And that allows a completely separate path for the leakage inductance energy to escape and go back to the main power rail. Now something else you can do, which I've drawn over here, is called a sandwich winding. And that's where you wind half of the primary and then stop. Then you put the secondary winding on and then you wind the rest of the primary on top of it. So that the secondary is like sandwiched between two halves of the primary winding. And this sort of encourages the magnetic field to take a broader path so that it encompasses all the windings and that increases the mutual inductance and decreases the uh, leakage inductance. Now most transformers will actually contain more than one secondary winding at the output. That's because vo uh, engineers need different voltages at the output. And sometimes what they'll do is to actually take the different secondaries and connect them in series like I've drawn here. And the reason they do that is to think of it like this. If I was to cover all of this, and then I think of this as my secondary winding, the number of turns here would correspond to the voltage which I need out. Then to get my other voltage which I need, instead of winding something separate, I simply tap off the voltage which I need from the winding which is already there, and then take that out into a capacitor. Now, if you were to do this, you would have to pay attention to this winding because this winding would need to be able to carry the current from this output and it also has to carry the current from this other output here. Now, another consideration is that these two outputs would have to share a common ground, meaning that if you needed isolated outputs, you couldn't do this. Now, in the case of high voltage transformers, for example, uh, transformers which are connected to the main supply and step down to 12 volts, it's a good idea to connect the high voltage part to a uh, winding which is as far away from the low voltage winding as possible. And that will cut down on the interturn capacitance and it will also cut down the chance of any flashover or breakthrough through the insulation. Now, another problem which can occur with these type of transformers where the uh, windings are completely isolated and there's also a big voltage difference between them is that electrostatic buildup can occur. Now in order to prevent this engineers will take a bobbin and put a copper shield around it like this and make sure the copper shield is actually open so that it doesn't create a short for the transformer. Then they would solder a, a wire to it and take that to the earth and then they would put insulating tape around this and then uh, they would wind the primary then they would put more insulating tape, then another copper shield also connected to the earth, then more insulating tape, and then they would put the secondary winding on, and that would cut down on any electrostatic buildup. Another problem with transformers like this is that because they're open, they can emit sort of uh, electromagnetic waves, which can uh, create interference. And in order to prevent that, engineers will put a piece of copper foil, a copper tape around the transformer like this, and solder it at the back and then uh, again connect this to the earth and that will cut down on the EMI or electromagnetic interference. Now the transformer that I've drawn here you'll see the primary and secondary windings are sandwiched close together. That's done to create good mutual inductance between them so that the transformer itself is efficient. Now electrical engineers are concerned with efficiency not only of the transformers but of the converters themselves not because they want you to save money on your electricity bill but because if the converter or transformer is not efficient, that means that some of the energy passing through it will be converted to heat. Now heat can easily destroy the system, for example, if you have a, a power converter which is a thousand watts, but is only 80% efficient, which is a pretty good efficiency by the way. It means you're going to end up roughly with about 200 watts of power in the form of heat. Now 200 watts of heat is no joke, and it can easily melt components and cause fires. So that heat needs to be removed, and that becomes an engineering challenge, especially if the converter is a small package. So the idea is to keep efficiencies high and keep heat generation low. Another way in which heat can be detrimental to the system is that it can actually uh, change the magnetic properties of the core. Now this can be a little bit complicated, but I'll simply refer you to some of the PDFs which I'm going to link below in the description for a discussion on that but it definitely needs to be factored into the design process. Now another way that heat can be produced in your transformer is losses in the copper wire themselves. Now the way that they choose copper wire is usually based on the amount of current which it has to carry and they will choose the diameter of the wire based on that. 
Usually they can use the average current, but if you want to make your transformer tough, they can choose the peak current, which is going to be different. Now there's another problem with switch mode power supplies, and that is because the, they are switching on and off very quickly. The current that's in the wire is uh, of a high frequency. Now when you have high frequency currents in a wire, there's an effect called the skin effect, and that is where the current carrying electrons are actually forced to the surface of the copper wire and form a thin layer here. The depth of that layer is called the skin depth, and this massively increases the resistance of the copper wire, and so you get losses due to this. The reason it happens is that if you were to imagine two electrons inside the wire here, and then I pass an electric field into the page to make the current in, go into the page, then each electron would have a little magnetic field like this, and you can see that these magnetic fields sort of butt against each other, and this would force the electrons away from each other, and they all end up on the surface like this. Now, what engineers uh, do to get around this is to take, instead of one large copper wire, they'll take many thin, small pieces of copper wire and braid them together, and twist them together, and this is called Litz wire. Here you can see this is an example of Litz wire. Now there are several braids here, but if you just simply look at one braid very closely, you'll be able to see that it's contained a very small, thin, hair-like uh, strands. Now this obviously came from a very high power uh, application. Something more common, which you will see, is a transformer like this. And if you look at these windings closely, you might be able to see that they're actually uh, made of very, very thin wires themselves, and this is called Litz wire. You can buy it, it's expensive, but you can also make it yourself, but it's time consuming. So that will help you cut down on the wire losses. So that's it for the uh, transform introduction to transformers. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please uh, post them below. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so using the links below. Thanks a lot. See you later.